Welcome to History 101. Dave Batty is the official Snoqualmie historian. His commitment to preserving and enhancing Snoqualmie's historic character through his service on the Snoqualmie Landmark Commission, resulting in having some of our most significant historic properties designated as landmarks and a comprehensive inventory of historic properties in Snoqualmie's business district was completed. As a result, Snoqualmie received one of the first designations of a historic commercial district in King County. Dave was involved with the acquisition of the Meadowbrook Farm and since its inception and continues to provide tours and history lessons to hundreds. On December 9th, 2011, Dave was presented with the City of Snoqualmie Lifetime Achievement Award in honor and recognition of exceptional leadership, generosity and long-standing civic contribution, and dedication to the Valley's memory and history. On December 10th, Dave was appointed as the official, first official historian for Snoqualmie. He has presented the history of Snoqualmie at the Citizens Academy since its inception in 2007. This is a brief history of the city of Snoqualmie, Washington, 98065 and the missing mill town of Snoqualmie Falls, Washington, 98066 and the annexation of the little town of Meadowbrook into Snoqualmie through the 1950s. Most of the photographs are courtesy of the Snoqualmie Valley Historical Society and I cannot emphasize enough how exceptional the photo collection is for our local museum. It's pretty wonderful. We had serious cataclysmic beginnings in this valley. 20,000 years ago, the Vashayan Glacier covered the valley. Between 15 and 18,000 years ago, the Vashon Glacier advanced and retreated multiple times. Each advance created a gravel dam blocking the middle fork of the Snoqualmie and forming a vast lake. Each time the lake breached the gravel barrier, water carrying masses of rock and aggregate rushed in to fill the upper Snoqualmie Valley. Snoqualmie Falls was formed by the Vashon Glacier. Multiple bursting of the gravel dam filled our valley with gravel and boulders. The glaciers paused to create Snoqualmie Falls where the gravel dam pushed the river over onto bedrock. And when the glacier finally receded, the river was unable to cut through the rock and Snoqualmie Falls was formed. The valley filled with gravel is a giant untapped aquifer, a water supply for the future of the Puget Sound area. Should mention that our valley is not V-shaped as if it were cut by a river. It's not U-shaped as if it were cut by a glacier. It goes down and is flat because it was full, filled with all of this gravel. The slowly receding glacier left a very frigid and barren landscape. Humans began passing through about 9,400 years ago, making trails over the Cascades. The, the, the Native Americans on the east side and west side beat their heads against that ice. They wanted to, they knew about each other because of, uh, of the Columbia River Valley and they wanted to have a more northern route. So they really worked on that as the ice left us. So let's see here. Seasonal human settlement began in the upper valley perhaps 7,000 years ago. The issue with when the settlement started after the ice left is a difficult issue that is made more valuable because of the Seattle Cedar River watershed. The watershed being protected, protected the archeology. span And so the, the, they keep moving the time when we first had humans going over the past back farther and farther as they find more our archeological evidence. So the Ice Age left us with no large flora in the valley. 
the valley floor became a natural grassy prairie. At some time, the natives began burning the prairie to foster plants used for food, such as the native bracken fern, camas, tiger lilies, and the small native blackberries. European Americans. The Indian Wars of 1855 and 56 brought militia and forts to the valley, actually three forts. There were concerns that the Yakamas would come west as allies of the coastal Indians and wipe out the whites. Our major fort was Fort Alden, located between the river and Park Street and across from the expanded Mount Si High School. The Indians never came and the fort was soon abandoned. That doesn't mean that there wasn't bloodshed, it just was not in our valley. There was a Battle of Seattle. Fort Alden was the most substantial local fort. It had an escape tunnel to the Snoqualmie River Bank. What this really means is, and I've emphasized this to both city mayors, if we have ground penetrating radar in this valley for any other reason, and we can afford to have them check that area out, that tunnel would show up and we would be able to find out exactly where the original Fort Alden was. <clears throat> so in 1858, a much younger than this picture, Jeremiah Borst came over the Cedar River Trail. He dropped down into the upper valley and decided to settle in the abandoned Fort Alden. Borst and the other pioneers loved the deep prairie soil and the lack of trees. He planted apple trees and dried the fruit for shipping to Seattle. He grew hogs and cured the hams and bacon for shipment to Seattle. Jeremiah was a very successful farmer and soon owned much of the upper valley. He was a very nice guy. We've never heard, you know, we've never found anything negative written about him. He was deeply helpful to his neighbors and often that meant that they ended up owing him more than they could pay back and so they would give him their, their land and move on because back then you could just go elsewhere and set up a, a, another opportunity. So the trip to Seattle from the valley was arduous. First you ported your goods down the Snoqualmie Falls Hill on the other side of where we go down today. If you were lucky, the steamboat got as far as Falls City, which had an S on the end back then. The boat traversed down the Snoqualmie to Snoqualmie, Snohomish and then on to Everett, and finally the goods were usually transferred to another ship for transport to Seattle. Uh, Boris's early apples were mush by the time they got to Seattle, and that's why he started uh, drying them. This is a wonderful picture. We're very fortunate to have this. I want to point out in the left-hand side, the, the corner is cracked. This is a glass slide. This is a glass negative. And uh, we're very fortunate to have this wonderful little steamboat alki on the Snoqualmie River near Falls City. Snoqualmie Hop Ranch and Meadowbrook Farm. In 1882, Borst sold much of his land to the Hop Growers Association. The principals were Captain George W. Gove on the left, Richard Jeffs on the right, and D.K. Baxter. And if you ever run into a picture of D.K., we would love to add him. The Snoqualmie Hop Ranch was soon billed as the largest hop ranch in the world. John Muir visited and wrote about hops, Snoqualmie Falls, and our valley in 1889. Hops were not just king in Snoqualmie Valley, but in much of western Washington. The boom lasted about 15 years until the world market fell due to overproduction and an aphid infestation damaged quality. This wonderful artist's rendition is the Snoqualmie Valley in 1889. Now, we had uh, dated this long before I finally found the original in a book in the, in the Seattle Public Library. 
Um, we were able to date it as 1889 because in the background there is the railroad. And the railroad came to the valley in 1889. And it says Washington Territory. And Washington Territory became Washington State in 1889. Uh, in the lower right, there's a, a, a mill. And that's actually a steam-driven mill. And that big barn on the left is the horse barn for the horses that were used to do the farming. Hops still grow in Meadowbrook Farm fence rows. Native American hop pickers came from as far away as the Fraser River in Canada. Only silver dollars were acceptable by the Native Americans as payment. As many as 2,000 pickers were needed each year. About 1,200 Native Americans and 800 uh, others. The Indians camped on the island defined by the circular slough near the Mount Si golf course that includes today's off-leash dog park. Native American hot pickers and Robert Terhune. Robert there in the middle was a, um, a manager, a hop ranch manager. Uh, this is, we're very fortunate. There's lots of hop picking pictures from Western Washington. But most of the ones from Snoqualmie are easily identified as Snoqualmie because back there, can you see Mount Si in the background? Yeah, they did that a lot with the pictures. Uh, Darius Kinsey photo of hop fields. This, this field, if uh, I, I you know, check this out, this is really kind of where Snoqualmie Elementary School stands today. Snoqualmie Hop Pickers by Dur Darius Kinsey. This is probably the most famous Native American hop picking picture in, um, in Washington history. Um, now, you see the scythe blade? That scythe blade um, on a pole is how they cut the vines loose for the folks to, cut, uh, to pick the hops off. First school met in a hop ranch building. Now, this isn't the first first school because the first school was Jeremiah Borst having some educated folks come in to teach his children. But the, finally they formed a school district. And so this is the very first school after a school district was formed and it was, um, it was in a hop ranch building. And Lulu Thompson is the teacher and we have uh, Thompson Street on the ridge is named for her and her family. Now, uh, the, the older boy on, on the left is one of Jeremiah Borst's boys. The little girl in front who looks like she doesn't have any shoes on is, uh, is really um, Ella Pike. And Ella Pike, uh, married Bill Fury and was the mother of my uncle, Connell Pike Fury, who we'll see later. The Hop Ranch Hotel, later named the Meadowbrook Inn, was built around 1885 and dismantled in 48. It was located in the new Mount Si High School expansion area on Park Street. Big, wonderful building. The Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad triggers two towns. Puget Sound entrepreneurs decided not to wait for big money Eastern interests. They were, they were interested in a, a railroad to Portland, but not to Seattle. So the locals financed the Lake, Seattle Lakeshore Eastern Railroad, which reached the Upper Valley in 1889. The beautiful Snoqualmie Depot was built in 1890 to draw tourists. The agricultural and timber crops of the Upper Valley could now efficiently reach national markets. S Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Terminus was at Salal Prairie just outside of North Bend. Didn't go any further, but this opened up many acres of timber and farmland to Seattle markets and beyond. Here's the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern, later Northern Pacific Depot 
in Snoqualmie when it was quite new. The coming of the railroad in 1889 triggered the planting of North Bend in February and Snoqualmie by Seattle investors in August. Tourism exploded as the railroad brought the beauty of Snoqualmie Falls and Mount Si and the valley's hunting, hiking, and fishing opportunities to the world. Entrepreneurs bought lots and started a business catering to the needs of permanent residents and temporary visitors. This, these are <laughs> wonderful pictures. So, uh, you know, the, the, the woman in the upper right is holding a box camera and her friend is holding on to her. Uh, on the left, you can see that you know, this was not set up for tourists, and, uh, but a wonderful, wonderful work. To, to have these pictures is really, really priceless. Original plat map of Snoqualmie Falls, Washington. Now the S for Snoqualmie is a snake, and the F-A-L-L-S falls down the falls, which uh, actually happened because Snoqualmie dropped the falls from the name within a decade. Tradition states that Edmund and Louisa Kinsey bought the first lots in the new town. They had six quite entrepreneurial children. Kinsey Interests built the first livery stable, the first hotel, the first dance hall, the first meat market, the first church, etc. Three of the boys learned photography from a hotel client, and two of them, Darius and Clark, became the most famous of all Pacific Northwest logging photographers. Here's the Kinsey family. And in 1887, two years before they came to the valley. Uh, now you'll notice that it says Mrs. Kinsey. Well, she was known in all records as Mrs. Edmund John Kinsey, as were generally married women back then. So trying to find out that her real name was Louisa was kind of an interesting challenge, but. I had Methodist church records, and uh, they did straighten things out for us. This is the first known photograph of downtown Snoqualmie. And that's a puncheon road there, and uh, that, that split cedar that you put down in the mud so that you didn't sink in. Gins Kinsey livery stable, uh, this this uh, went through the transition to automobiles later. Uh, that's the, the Snoqualmie Hotel, not the Kinsey Hotel. Here's the first Kinsey Hotel. Uh, and that's Edmund John on his haunches there on the steps. Look at the berry, baby carriage wheels. It's just a wonderful picture to have. Now here is the second Kinsey Hotel. And the bell in the Methodist Church is dedicated to E.J. Kinsey. The church building was moved across the street in the 30s and is now the American Legion Hall, which is right across the street from the, the Snoqualmie Council Chambers. Uh, that lower right picture is Clark Kinsey with a bunch of his photo equipment. I correspond with his grandson who has a lot of his equipment in his basement. The Reinig family. Leonard and Margaretha Reinig bought their family to the Snoqualmie Valley in 1890. Leonard made his fortune in the bakery and mercantile business in Seattle. The two old sons, Otto and Dio, opened the Reinig Brothers store in 1903. It burned in 1908 was rebuilt and is now the Carmichael's True Value Hardware Store. Otto Reinig was mayor of Snoqualmie from 1905 to 1915 and postmaster for 31 years. Here's the Reinig family. Um, so Eddie is the uh, youngest one there. He was quite a genius and at a very early age was managing the Seattle City Light power plant 
uh, up on the Cedar River. So, uh, but he died young. But uh, the back there are Otto and Dio. So, the first Reinig Brothers store on the left, the rebuilt store after the fire on the right, the original store lower left, um, and, <laughs> and that magnolia that uh, many of you from Snoqualmie would recognize was the mini Reinig Magnolia. She and Otto had a, had a, uh, a house right where that magnolia is. 1903, Snoqualmie Incorporates. The new little town of Snoqualmie was hit very hard by the National Recession of 1893. As a matter of fact, that's the, the recession that, that killed the Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railroad and Northern Pacific picked them up. Then soon after, the hops market collapsed but the town struggled on against the $300 price originally placed on lots in 1889. To bypass paying the unreasonable price of a lot, barns, homes, and outdoor houses, orchards, businesses, etc., were built in the public street access. Finally, the Seattle investors who had platted the town dropped the lot price to $45 and slowly, people bought the lots adjacent to their structures and moved their structures out of the streets. Now, today, in, in the older part of Snoqualmie, there's lot line issues with folks eaves going over their lot lines and things like that based on this challenge. Finally, in 1903, the town voted to incorporate under the laws of the state of Washington. The highest paid public official was the sheriff, who was expected to do everything. He built railroad crossings, bridge railings, sidewalks, upheld the laws, buried dead calves, collected the poll tax, worked all male prisoners every day, attended the needs of families under quarantine, and notified folks when their water closets were not in a sanitary condition. The job of the sheriff was so challenging that in spite of the high pay, it changed hands 12 times from 1903 until 1910. And then the town, full of hard living, hard drinking loggers, and heavily dependent on saloon tax revenues, voted to go dry. Uh, not for very long. They really needed those revenues from the saloons. Now, how do I know all of this? I, I had a good friend for, for the uh, 1990 flood. She was helping the city of Seattle clean up some down, downtown buildings. There was an older book um, on the floor open uh, in the water, which was only about an eighth of an inch deep and uh, the workmen were going to throw this book in the dumpster. And she said, I have a friend, Dave Batty, who might be interested in that book. It was the original minutes book for Snoqualmie from 1903, including the very first uh, council meeting through 1914. Meadowbrook. After the hop market crashed around 1900, the hop ranch land was owned by H. Dutard, the, pea, the bean and wheat king from Sacramento, California. He actually was the last treasurer of the hop ranch and loaned the money and that's how he ended up with the farm. Dutard ran the farm under the name Snoqualmie Ranch. He sold out to Chamberlain and Hamilton who renamed it Meadowbrook Farm. Their primary crop was potatoes, and in 1904, Arthur William Pratt purchased the farm and appointed Angus J. Moffat as manager. So starting in 1904, Meadowbrook Farm was primarily a dairy operation. Kind of fun to have a, a color picture, an older color picture with the cows. Hop poles were reused as cattle fencing. Uh, the category collection issue, um, in the 1930s, the manager of Meadowbrook Farms house in the little town of Meadowbrook burned. With it went the photo collection 
of Meadowbrook Farm. So we've been trying to collect and, and a Japanese family in California whose grandfather was a milker in this dairy um, had these pictures and sent them to us. There were six large dairy barns and one horse barn on Meadowbrook Farm and now all of them are gone. There's a moo through under SR202 to c connect the main pasture with one of the barns. Dairy-related businesses sprung up in the area where the original Fort Alden brought Jeremiah Borst to the valley. And in 1923, Arthur William Pratt and his wife Dora platted the town of Meadowbrook, now part of Snoqualmie. Meadowbrook teams, horse barn, and equipment April 12, 1911. So this is, that big barn is the horse barn. All the other barns were uh, dairy barns. It's located uh, in, the lo in the former trailer park area between Meadowbrook Way and Park Street. So it's really right across from the uh, expanded Mount Si High. Town of Meadowbrook Ariel about 1943 uh, this is kind of wonderful if you notice how many clotheslines are out with clothes on them because homes did not have dryers in 43. Meadowbrook Barn on SR202 at Swing Rock. Now if you are on 202 between Snoqualmie and North Bend, about halfway on your right hand side, uh, you'll see Swing Rock or what's left of it. And in the blackberries there, you would find that concrete foundation for that big barn is still there, as well as a huge foundation for a huge silo that was on the far end. And the foundation for on the left here, you can see the little milk house. So this is the barn that a highway underpass had to be built under SR202 when uh, Highway 202 went in. Meadowbrook barn across from the current location of Centennial Park. And that concrete foundation is also there. Uh, this is the winter of 4950, which is the ugliest, worst winter in recorded human history. Now, Meadowbrook was unincorporated. It didn't have any money. So the uh, folks took up a collection to get a, a, a bulldozer driver to clear their streets. Meadowbrook Condensed Milk Kempting, and we don't have any clue where this particular building was. Meadowbrook Creamery, and we don't have a clue. This is a category photo, by the way. We don't have a clue uh, where this building was. Angus Moffat managed Meadowbrook Farm for A.W. Pratt for almost 40 years, retiring in 1943. The farm workers were fed in the brick building now known as the Colonial Apartments at Meadowbrook Way uh, and Park Street. M uh, many of the, the workers bunked in the Hop Ranch Hotel. Other crops were raised on the farm such as beans, corn, peas, and broccoli. For some years, a local cannery thrived. So can you get more local than Tokel brand? So this is the Meadowbrook uh, label. And I had about a half a dozen folks bring these labels to me when they found I was interested in local history. Evidently, when they f closed it down, uh, the employees grabbed handfuls of these labels and they're all over the valley. Snoqualmie so Falls Lumber Company, the Warehouser and the Fisher families bring stable employment to the valley. In 1900, Warehouser purchased land in the Snoqualmie Valley that was checkerboarded with Rockefeller timber holdings. The need for building material following the San Francisco 1906 earthquake and fire triggered purchase of adjacent pieces of the checkerboard by the Grandin Coast Lumber Company uh, and the Fishers were the principals in that company. In 1914, that's by the way the same Fisher flouring mill Fisher family. In 1914, Warehouser and Grandin Coast incorporated the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company to build the second all-electric mill in the nation. Now, 
why did it take a while there? It took a while because San Francisco decided to do most of the rebuilding with brick and, brick and didn't need the limber. This is what the forests looked like. This picture was in the uh, mill manager's office for about 40 years. It took two years to plan the mill and then begin creating the surrounding mill town of Snoqualmie Falls, Washington, which by the way is my hometown. World War I created major manpower and material shortages. Women were hired for some jobs traditionally held by men. Japanese nationals were imported to build the logging railroad and were housed on the mill site. The mill town of Snoqualmie Falls grew to include 250 homes. That's almost exactly how many homes. A general store, 50 bed hospital, which is the largest hospital this side of Seattle. Grade school, community hall, YMCA, which was the largest YMCA in Western Washington. A railroad station, barber shop, boarding house and hotel. Boarding house and hotel were for the single men. If you uh, rented a house, you had to have a family. This was how they guaranteed that the loggers were more stable. A heart of the mill town, 1944. So, uh, upper right hand corner is that hospital. Uh, to the left upper is that huge building is the YMCA. Um, the lower left middle is the company store. Uh, there weren't big, big box stores men. This was a huge store by any standards. So this is a fun aerial. Warehouser had the money to document and Warehouser Archives had some wonderful pictures that we were able to get a hold of. 1920 aerial of Meadowbrook Farm headquarters on the left down there, the, the horse park and Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company Mill. Now you see that's the older Meadowbrook Bridge. That bridge has been replaced. Um, the uh, upper middle is lumber drying in the open in Western Washington. But that's how they did it because they didn't have very many steam dry kills. Now you notice that they had cut all of the timber off of the island in the middle of the mill pond that was to increase the, the uh, air flow to dry that lumber. And that field in the front of us, that field became the town of Meadowbrook in 1923. Mill One was built to handle 11 foot in diameter Douglas fir and cut its first log on November 25th, 1917. Mill Two, size for smaller western hemlock and western red cedar opened on May 24th, 1918. Wood was a primary strategic material for World War I and ships timbers and airplane stock from Sitka spruce, which was very rare in the woods, were the first item, items produced. The U.S. Army recru recruited soldiers to work in the woods and the mill under the auspices of the Spruce Production Board. This is one of two pictures we have of women in the mill, World War I. Now the fun thing is that the open catalog uh, on the lower left is a, a Kinsey catalog. So the Kinseys would come and take pictures and sell those pictures to both the mill management and the employees. Uh, Japanese, this, this is a fun, I want to point out here, the, the, this is the Japanese community, but notice right in the middle of the little boy, very soon there were families in the Japanese community. Now, so to this group goes the honor of the largest daily output of logs in the state of Washington, Camp B, Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company, July 11, 1918. So, people wanted these jobs bad.
because you got paid the difference between what a normal mill worker in the woods would get and your army pay. So people lied about their mill and woods experience to get into the mill and woods uh, under the Spruce Production Board. And we actually had to send mill management folks down to Camp Lewis to interview soldiers to make sure that they had the right experience. Springboard needed to get you above the thickest part of a tree and get you above where it was tough because the wind whipped the tree and this became tougher down here. And then that's where the pitch tended to be. So that's why we had those early tall stumps. <clears throat> now this, this, wonder, this, this is by far the biggest spruce log I've ever seen in my life. Um, imagine how many airplanes you could make out of that. The spruce is very strong, very light, and uh, very clear. So, <laughs> there's Mitty Terhune leaning out the cab. This is a normal, there were six big steam lo locomotives in the railroad for logging for the Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company. and. Uh, Mitty is, uh, is the father of the uh, hop ranch manager we saw earlier. So this is the last load of logs coming out of the woods by train. Now why was it the last load? Because trucks were more efficient. Now most everybody has seen these trucks before whether you recognize them or not. They, uh, uh, they are on the side of a building painted down in, uh, in Snoqualmie. And I gave the artist this black and white. He came back to me and said, I'm doing it in color. What color were they? So I went to my good friend who was probably about 93 or 94 then, Gloria McNeely and Gloria's husband drove the yellow truck on the right and remembered the colors of the other two trucks. Her memory is still incredible and she's now 101. So this is a fun picture because uh, action of uh, logs into the mill pond. And then uh, if you could blow this up, you could see the a lot of the town is on the hill behind this picture. Mill one in the foreground and mill two in the background. Now, the burner went away in 46 and the second stack on the right was built in 44. Knowing these things, it uh, makes it easier to date some of these pictures. Oh, the, this is wonderful and at schools, the kids just love this picture. Um, the bull chain, right in the middle there, pulls the logs into the mill. But the diameter of this log is such that it, 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 the bull chain was slipping and wouldn't do the job. So these folks are not attempting to push that log into the mill like it looks they are. It, they're going to put that wire rope around the end of the log and hook it to the bull, ch bull chain in the mill and that will then pull the log in. That's about as big a log as they were able to cut. Here's a 10 foot six on an 11 foot bandsaw. Uh, this is prior to hard hats. Notice the saw um, is that dark black band between the two gentlemen on the right. That's the actual bandsaw. Here is a 1919 picture of that bandsaw. So there's a huge mill wheel up there and another one below the floor. One of those mill wheels, uh, perhaps this one, is on display at River and Railroad in downtown Snoqualmie. The steam, steam drove that carriage at a pretty good pace. 
Electric chainsaws first came to the woods in 1938, gas in 1943. That's uh, Connell Pike Fury, my uncle on the right. His mother was the little girl without any shoes on in the school picture. Uh, that's Lars Oltang on the left. This is an electric, you can see the electric car cord on the left. These uh, were not very well insulated. So you got shocked when you were using them. Not, you know, nothing dangerous, but uh, maybe a little uncomfortable. Mill number one burner was no longer needed in 1946. The entire valley was on the hill above the mill watching this get blasted. It was a big deal. The town of Snoqualmie Falls disappears. My hometown disappears. By the mid-1950s, the need for the company, a company town had diminished considerably. People had their own automobiles. The reason for building the town in the first place was that the common individual did not have an automobile to bring themselves to work. Folks wanted equity in their home, so that was very important, and the maintenance and taxes were increasing for Weyerhaeuser on these older homes. Finally, in 1958, the bulk of the remaining homes were moved over a temporary bridge to become the Williams addition to Snoqualmie, which has never been annexed to Snoqualmie. Um, the mill continued on as the primary employer for the Snoqualmie Valley, and in fact, a huge plywood plant was opened at Snoqualmie in 1959. I was 19, but I was inter interested enough in local history and uh, living in Seattle, but I bought the valley record that, that they put out to uh, announce the opening of the plywood plant. It was a valley record rolled up this big, as big as a Seattle Times Sunday newspaper back then, full of the history of the valley and the mill. The town of Snoqualmie Falls moves to the Williams edition in Snoqualmie, 1958, over a temporary bridge. So if you go down on uh, River Street uh, past the uh, hardware store to the river, that's where this bridge was. Now it's fascinating, people left their, mat their, their material goods in the houses. So they jacked the house up, put it on the truck, took it and its front furnishings over and plopped it down in the new lot. So, uh, except that there are wonderful stories about people nailing the, the console black and white TVs to the floor just to make sure they wouldn't get hurt. The teens in World War I, they were out of uh, the uh, mill story down looking at the town again. Pre-World War I, Snoqualmie was a quiet town in transition. The Meadowbrook Farm dairy operation did not create the job opportunities or require the seasonal influx of employees, of workers that the hop ranch had needed. Logging was increasing, but there were no large mills and valley logs were generally processed elsewhere, including being successfully sent over Snoqualmie Falls and picked up below the falls and taken down the mills lower. But World War I and the new Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company mill finally brought prosperity. First cars in town, so Cy Summers won. This was a little contest. I had a, a, a group of uh, older church members for a church history committee for five years. and. The, these folks were full of pictures and magic stuff. And so they had a little challenge over who the very first person to have a car in the town of Snoqualmie was in Cy one, and Otto Reinig was uh, second. The Methodist Church, the Kinsey Homes, and the Vaughn School, 1910. So the current Methodist Church is on that same footprint, although it's not the same building. 
uh, <coughs> the Vaughn School is a crazy issue. It's called the Vaughn School because it was the Snoqualmie Elementary, it was the Snoqualmie School, and then Snoqualmie sold it to the Vaughn family, and from that point on, it became known as the Vaughn School. Snoqualmie Street, scene 1911. Notice that wonderful fancy stuff on the top of the railroad depot? We don't know whether it was cast iron or what, but and, and everybody would love to put that back on. So if you have spare change and want to offer your money, I'm sure that the, there's always something more important that the railroad has to spend its money on, but it would be wonderful to have that filigree back on. Team hauling wood on Railroad Avenue, circa 1910. Look at that, it's just wonderful. Main Street, 1913. The prosperous 20s. In the 20s were a great time in Snoqualmie. Automobiles became the normal mode of transportation. The livery stable made the transition to automobiles and finally to the brick storefronts that we know as what the candy factory and uh, there's a, a drug store. A few brick bank, the, the new brick bank building was built in 1923. At the Snoqualmie Falls Com Lumber Company Mill, a new community hall YMCA was dedicated and a sustained yield policy guaranteed the forests would be replenished after harvest. This was incredibly forward-looking, very early for that to be done. The town of Meadowbrook was platted. The Brook Theater opened in Meadowbrook in 1923 and transitioned to Talkies in 1929. And then the Great Depression hit. Main Street in 29. Bank building built in 23. Became the headquarters for Washington State Bank that a, a local banker owned seven banks on the east side, including Bellevue. Tana Meadowbrook, uh, Brook Theater, and the H.K. Allman Drugstore. So now all of you folks on the ridge know where the Allman street name came from. So he was the druggist in um, Meadowbrook and he lost a daughter to polio. We had some polio issues. The 1930s were tough times in the valley. The SR202 bridge at Snoqualmie Falls wooden pilings burned and it fell into the river on December 14th, 1933. Why is this a big deal? It's as if we lost a major bridge on I-90. This 202 through Snoqualmie was the major northern tier east-west highway in the United States. So the bypass was to, <laughs> to use Mill Pond Road, which was flooding. So it was a tough time. Movie ticket sales dropped, the lowest being sales being in 1932. I know this because I ended up with the corporate books of that theater and was able to map all of the, the ticket sales and, and I could prove that the worst uh, year for the Valley for the Great Depression was 32. Silent movie theaters closed in Snoqualmie and North Bend. At Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company Mill, mill workers went to a four-day work week with a 10% cut in wages, 12.5% for management. The mill managed to stay on, open. Then World War II came to Europe and mill production picked up for the war effort. Oh, this is priceless. This is the 20 millionth Ford that ever came off the production line. So Henry Ford was not just a good engineer, he was in a uh, he was a classic PR man. And so the 20 millionth Ford went all over the United States. And there was a big Ford dealer right across the street from the Methodist Church. Now that, 
That Methodist church went through a fire in 39, but the current one is on the same uh, footprint. So you can tell where this picture was taken. Oil truck hits bridge on December 14, 1933. Wooden pilings burned. Excuse me. Unfortunately, it was flooding season, and you can see the stuff stacking up against the steel girders. So the county had hoped they'd be able to just pop it back up. The flood po pushed it parallel with the far side, and they had to blast this part of the bridge out to rebuild the new one. Recovery from the Great Depression was well on its way when World War II hit. All local Japanese workers and families were interned. The Snoqualmie Falls Lumber Company mill went to a 48-hour work week. Gas rationing made the walk to work ways of the Great Depression the norm again. Uh, folks in Snoqualmie could walk over the bridge that is now the Snoqualmie Valley Trail Bridge that went directly into the mill. Women once again entered the workforce in non-traditional jobs and a civil defense airplane watch was initiated in a shack atop City Hall for the entire duration of the war. Snoqualmie bypassed. The most impactive local change of the 40s came in 1942. The new cross-state highway, US-10, was opened. This included the new floating bridge over Lake Washington. It also meant that Fall City and Snoqualmie were no longer on the primary highway to the east. This was very hard on tourists-oriented infrastructure. North Bend was not yet affected by this bypass. Women in the Mill, World War II, first shift, 1943. Main Street, 1941, that's City Hall right in the middle. That's now Mignon's. Note flag, air raid siren, and spotter shack on City Hall. That's not the current air raid siren that's on top of Mignon's. That's a later model. Uh, but, you know, this was serious for the war. And here is the airplane spotter shack that was on top of City Hall. So these folks were volunteers who were trained to be able to identify aircraft and scan the skies all day. <clears throat> the 1950s were good times, even with the Highway 10, now I-90 bypass. And in 1952, the town of Meadowbrook was annexed to the town of Snoqualmie. In 1958, as we've heard, people bought mill houses, small for $100 and large for $150, and moved them out of the town of Snoqualmie Falls over a temporary bridge into the town of Snoqualmie. And, and I've actually seen the contracts for, a, I have scanned a contract for a $100 house and for a $150 house. And that, that, you know, the, this is wonderful, except that you had to find a lot that would perk and you had, had water and electricity and build a foundation, so it was, uh, it was uh, still a challenge. In August of 1959, a huge new plywood plant opened at the Weyerhaeuser Mill. So that's the beginning of the, where we are. And uh, let's see, my name is David Batty, and if you would like to ask me a historic question, my email address is D-A-V-E underscore B-A-T-T-E-Y at M-S-N dot com. That's Dave underscore Batty at M-S-N dot com. Thank you very much.